Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lynn Plunkett, and um, I am going to be presenting your charter system um, annual training, or at least part of it. Uh, Mrs. Reese is also going to be presenting with me, and she'll be talking with you about um, things that are going on in uh, uh, Catoosa County. So what I'm going to be doing today is hopefully giving you some information about some um, some of the work that you're doing as school governance teams and hopefully you're going to be able to have um, uh, some new ideas when we finish some things to take back to your school uh, some things to discuss in your uh, school governance team meetings um, that will help you be even more effective in the job that you do all right, let me tell you a little bit about myself before we get started. I am a retired superintendent. I retired uh, from Floyd County Schools, which is in Rome, Georgia, just a little south of you, um, in 2012. And um, since my retirement, I have been um, privileged to be able to work with charter systems all over the state um, through providing consulting services via the Georgia Department of Education and the Charter System Foundation. I've also um, been able to work with a lot of college and career academies, as you all have, um, through the not only the, the work with the Department of Education and the Charter System Foundation, but also with Technical College System of Georgia. So I've been doing the work um, of charter system uh, work, you know, from really... Uh, since we began as a charter system in Floyd County in 2010, we opened a college and career academy in 2008. So not only have I worked as a consultant with systems, but I've also worked as a leader in a charter system. So it's very, very nice to be with you today. And um, I really appreciate you asking me to, to be with you. So this is going to be about an hour um, we will not be able, obviously, you won't be able to ask me questions, but if you do have questions, please talk with your principal, um, and your principal can, can, can probably answer most of those questions for you, or can let you know who in your district can answer those questions for you. So let's take a look at our agenda. We're going to talk about what is a charter system, and then we're going to talk about what is effective governance in charter systems? How do you do your jobs in a way that um, produces very positive results for your students? And then we're going to talk for a little bit about what is this idea of broad flexibility? We hear all about that when we're talking about um, um, school governance teams and charter system work. So the first thing I want to talk with you about is what is a charter system? So if you look down here at the bottom, you will see there is a citation. It's a OCGA means the official um, code of Georgia annotated, which is uh, the Georgia law. And section 20 of the Georgia law is the section that governs education in Georgia. So in 2007, um, our legislators listened to what school folks had, and community people and parents and, you know, lots of folks who are doing that on the ground work of, um, of education. They listened to what they had been saying for a long time about local control and about the need to be able to design educational programs that fit the needs and the, the of the students fit the resources fit the challenges and not have to um, live by a set of state laws and rules and we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes when we talk about flexibility but prior to 2007 every school system in the state of georgia we have 180 um, school systems and every single system had to abide by the um the laws and the accompanying rules that um, were in Title 20. Um, it was very cumbersome. It very often kept schools and school districts from being able to provide some of the services they needed because the what the law said was in conflict with the needs in that system. And um, in order to, to get permission to um, waive any of those laws, there had to be, um, there was a long process 
that required a school district a school district to file a waiver uh, for the state to the state board of education. It was you know kind of cumbersome. Took a long time to complete. Took a long time to get an answer back sometimes. And so um, very often that problem had increased or the problem had changed so that it had become a different kind of problem. And in many cases, a problem that was even more severe. So um, the Charter System Act of 2007 established charter systems in the state of Georgia. And what that meant was that if school systems wanted to be charter systems, they could apply to the state, send in an application as you all did in Catoosa. And if that application um, was approved, then there would be a contract that would be drawn up between the local board of education for a district and the state board of education. And that contract had some very specific things in it. Um, one of the district's um, conditions of the contract was that they had to have local school governance. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Another condition is that they had to use their flexibility and use their um, ability to waive the state laws and rules so that they could look at very innovative ways of, of um, educating students. And the other part was that they had to produce higher student achievement than they would have if they did not have that flexibility. The state, on the other hand, agreed in their part of the contract that they would um, give this broad flexibility to the district and that when money was appropriated by the legislature, charter systems would get additional funding. So that's kind of how the charter system piece came about. And um, we'll talk in a little more detail later about Katusa and how you all became a charter system. But right now, I'd like to talk about the a local school governance team and, and, and look at what does that really say? What does the law say about local school governance teams? Well, first of all, if you see this word right here, it says maximize. So um, charter systems are required to have local school governance teams at every school in the district. And they're also required to really maximize um, the input and the participation of that school governance team. So you can't just have it in name only. It has to do something. It has to have a job and it has to have a function. And you all in Catoosa County have done a great job with this. The law requires three groups of people to be involved in the governance team. Now you can have anybody else you want, but you must have parents, you must have teachers, and you must have community members. And you can have anybody else you want on the team as long as you do have those three groups represented. The team also has to have some decision-making authority, um, some way of providing input, some way of providing feedback, some way of, um, of participating in decisions about five different areas. And so let's talk about what those are. The first one is personnel. And personnel... Uh, is huge. As you well know, it, it involves um, the hiring and of everybody in, the, in, the, in your entire system. So that is not the job of the school governance team. The only position that the school governance team must have some input into is the principal selection in case of a vacancy. And that is done differently in every single charter system in the state. So uh, we'll talk in just a little while about how you all work with your district in that personnel piece. Um, but I think it's really important that you recognize that the law does not say that you're in charge of all personnel. Only the um, providing input into that selection of the principal in case of a vacancy. All right, financial decisions. Every system um, has a general, what we call a general fund budget, and that's the budget that your whole school system operates under. Every school gets a piece of that budget, and every school has a school budget. Now, the money comes in in a variety of ways. 
Uh, you have money that comes through state funding to your district. Your district passes it on to the schools. You might have funding that comes to you federally, and then that money is passed on to the schools. And you might have, uh, you definitely have money that comes in through local tax collections, and some of that money is passed to the schools. But we also have um, ways that the schools generate funds, uh, funding through fundraisers or through booster clubs and booster organizations, through PTA. Uh, schools also can uh, get grant money. So there are a lot of ways that money comes into that general, that, that school fund, that school budget. And so it's really important as a school governance team that you all understand how the money comes in. But it's also important that you understand where the money's going and how it's being spent. Now, your job is always going to focus on school improvement. So it is um, a, a, a task of the school governance teams to be um, participating um, in those conversations about building that budget and determining how those funds are going to be used to support the school improvement plan. Resource allocation is very closely tied to financial decisions, although resource allocation not only is money, resource allocation can be people, it can be in-kind services, it can be technology. So there are a lot of different things that come in under the resource allocation piece. But again, it's very important that you know what those resources are in your system which ones come to your schools and how those resources are being used and again how those are aligned with school improvement now curriculum and instruction is the third area and we do have a georgia curriculum it is called the georgia standards of excellence but charter systems can do a lot with that curriculum they can actually waive parts of the curriculum they can teach um, the curriculum is what is taught and they can teach it in different sequences from what the state says it should be or it must be taught in. Um, they can uh, create new courses. They can combine courses. So there are a lot of different ways that charter systems can use flexibility with their curriculum. A big an area where they really, really use this flexibility and is in instruction. And that means how that curriculum is delivered, how what you are teaching is being taught. Um, and so, again, it's important for you to know what is the curriculum that you all are using? How is it being taught? And is it um, aligning with what your school improvement plan says? Um, and then we come down to really the most important piece of it, I think, and that is establishing and monitoring the achievement of your school improvement goals. Um, you know, at the very minimum, school governance teams should be very much aware of what is in that school improvement plan. You do not need to be a content expert. You have teachers who are your math experts in science and social studies and foreign language and ELA. You don't need to be an expert as a school governance team member because your teachers are doing that. But what you do need to do is you do need to know um, what are those goals and have some input into developing those goals and looking at what are the challenges that your school is facing and what kinds of goals do you need to develop that will help you meet those challenges and create a better um, educational setting for your students. Um, and then I think it's also very important that you know throughout the year how you all are doing and meeting your goals. You know, are you are you making progress in math? Are you making progress in literacy? Are, how is your graduation rate looking? So it's important that you all get regular updates and many school governance teams receive updates on their school improvement plans and on those goals um, a, on a, a monthly basis. They do, they talk about them at every single meeting. And again, we will talk about um, in more detail when uh, Ms. Reese speaks with you, she'll talk to you more about what you all are doing in Katusa as far as the, those school improvement goals are concerned. And then the last area is school operations. 
And school operations is a huge piece. School operations um, is, it can be everything from a bail schedule to transportation, to dress code, to technology plans, school safety plans, facility plans, um, fundraisers. I mean, all kinds of things go into operations. So uh, your school calendar, your system calendar, that's all part of your school operations. So many, many, many of those areas of school operations can impact student achievement. And so it's important that you all know what those areas are in your school and you are following how the um, that operational piece is, again, aligning to your school improvement goals. Another thing that Georgia law makes very clear is that um, schools within a charter system are under the uh, management and the control of the local board of education. Although the superintendent will share um, her authority and will ask for your advice and will ask for your input, at the end of the day, those decisions are still made by the board, by the superintendent. The superintendent is the only person in your district who can make a recommendation to your board, and your board is the only body that can approve personnel, uh, approve policy, um, approve budget. Um, there are, you know, um, provide over um, hearings and to have that final say in, in like a due process hearing or uh, any of those kinds of things. So it's important that that school governance team members understand that you work very closely with your board of education. You don't work in opposition with your board of education. So that's a very important piece to remember. And because your, your board and your superintendent have a much bigger picture of the district than you all might have at your school. School governance teams tend to have a more um, a more localized focus and kind of a school based focus. So there are going to be some things that you may want to do that your your superintendent might say, "No, I'm so sorry, but we're not going to be able to do that because it is not going to be." a good thing for the overall good of the system. And remember, you are not a system of charter schools. You are a charter system and you're moving in one direction as a system. And although you may get there differently in your school, the idea is that if you are working on those local needs at your school, then as a district, you all are going to be stronger. So trust and common, uh, communication is extremely important between your superintendent, your board of education, and your school governance teams. Now, we have 48 systems in Georgia. Everybody wants to know who we are. Um, you'll see Catoosa. I have highlighted Catoosa's number 10 in alphabetical order. Your first year was um, 2016. That's when you became a charter system. And you had a five-year contract. And then um, last year, uh, I, I believe you asked for an extension to that contract. So we're going to be doing contract renewal this year. You're going to be hearing a lot about that. Um, you may be asked to provide some input into how you all have done in the last five years and what you want to accomplish going forward for the next five. You'll also see that many of our charter systems have an asterisk beside them, and that means that they either have a college and career academy in the system or they are associated with maybe a regional college and career academy. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Catoosa County and what your local school governance teams look like. All right, so and, and let me tell you that you all, um, just like you decide as a district how that uh, decision making piece is going to look and what the parameters are going to be for the school governance team decision making. You also decide within your district how your school governance teams are going to look. Um, if you are interested in where you can find more information about all this, you can either look at your, your uh, bylaws or handbook. I don't know 
if you have a, a if you call it bylaws or if you call it a handbook we have different you know terminology depending on the systems you can also go to your charter system contract and application the original application that your district um, completed and you can find all this information in there so in Catoosa County you all have um, a range of seven to nine members your principal is a non-voting member except in the case of a tie vote and at that point your principal can um, can cast a vote uh, you are required by your charter to have two certified staff members on each of your teams those are elected by your certified staff but your principal may appoint one of those two staff members um, you have two parents who are not school employees who are elected by your parents and you have two business and community members who are selected by your school uh, leadership team you also at the middle and high schools um, it's optional that you could have one or two students to serve on the team we have that that's a very very popular um, and very effective practice we have a lot a lot of districts that do that these um, students are non-voting and they are selected by the school leadership team and students um, can provide a wealth of information because they are very honest with you and they're very open and they can provide some really good perspective from a student standpoint uh, you all have um, staggered terms your school governance team members serve two years they serve from august 30th to one year to september 1st of the next year um, over a two-year period and when we say staggered terms it means that everybody doesn't rotate off at one time you have some of your members rotate off in some years and then other members rotate off in other years and that way you never have a totally brand new school governance team you do have a two-year term limit that you all have set and you have said members may not serve on multiple school teams and you've also said that multiple family members may not serve on the same team and that's a good practice because in both of those those last two about the multiple teams and serving on the same team you want to be sure that you are allowing as many people as possible to be a part of this process and if you don't limit things like terms or the the you know multiple family members serving on a team or members serving on multiple teams it gets to a point where you have the same people serving all the time and you're not growing that pool of of um of school governance team members and you want to be sure that you do that because i will tell you the people who come on the school governance team even when they rotate off they are so much stronger as parents and they have said that to us we have heard many many uh, school governance team members say that it made them a better parent in working with the school or it made them a better business and community member or it made them a better teacher in understanding and working with the school and understanding kind of the ins and outs of how the school operates so when we look at general governance team responsibilities everything revolves around school improvement as i said before um, adopting the school improvement plan and those updates is super important uh, knowing from the very beginning what is in that school improvement plan reviewing your progress and again i think this, that the more you can talk about your progress the better off you are um, even at at meetings um, monthly meetings to put that on the agenda at every meeting is a good idea it's important um, for you all as school governance team members as i said earlier to participate in identifying those instructional programs and look at operational processes and look at resources that are available and look at innovations that might be put into place or or that are already in place so and look to see how those are improving student achievement or are they improving student achievement uh, we've talked about the annual school budget and it's important that you all look at that budget through the lens of that school improvement plan and think about how that school improvement plan is able to to be sustainable through the funding that is provided and how it's provided 
and then again participating in hiring the principal in case of a vacancy. Um, the work that you do is so very, very important. And I think that one of the biggest um, benefits of school governance team work is that we have such varied opinions and such different, uh, different perspectives. And I think it takes that in order for really good decisions to be made. Some of the best decisions come out of conversations where people don't always agree on everything. And so you have to really think about how do you do your work respectfully and how do you do your work effectively and efficiently. Um, and your code of conduct will help you do that. Um, you probably will find your code of conduct in your handbook or in your bylaws. Um, most of our districts have their school governance teams sign a code of conduct at the beginning of the year. If you have not done that, you might want to see if that's something that your district does do. Um, a lot of things can be in that code of conduct because it's entirely up to you as a district as to how you, um, you develop that and what you think are those important things that you want to be sure that you put in a code of conduct for your, your school governance teams. And um, what you see here are just a few um, items that are very often in codes of conduct. And so most of those you're probably aware of. Some of them you may not be. So I just want to point out a couple of these to you. First of all, if you look down close to the, to the bottom here, you'll see that individual um, uh, school go local school governance team members have no authority. That means that you can only do business as a team when you're in a meeting. So you as an individual member cannot go to the principal or cannot go to a teacher and say, this is what needs to be done because you do not have the authority to do that. You also need to work very collaboratively with each other and speak with one voice. If you don't always get your vote, you know, that's going to happen. But your job is to support the vote of the majority and not to um, cast any kind of disparity on that decision because it wasn't necessarily the way that you wanted to, it to go. All right, mandatory child abuse reporter is another piece that you may not be aware of. Um, all educators in the state of Georgia, everybody who works with kids is required by law to report child abuse um, if they suspect that a child is being abused in any way. Now, every district has a protocol for reporting this. And if you don't know what your protocol is, this is a very good time for you to check into that and find out because um, child abuse reporting can get really sticky and messy. And you can imagine it's, it, it's, it's a very serious, serious offense. But you want to be sure that you are taking that responsibility very seriously, but that you're doing that um, reporting in a way that um, aligns with the protocol that your district has set up. Okay, it's also really, really important, I think, at this point to mention that school governance teams govern and they don't manage. Um, your principal is the manager of your school. Your superintendent and your board are the managers of your system. Your job is not to get all wrapped up in the day-to-day -day operation of that school system or of your school. That job has failed. You do not have that role. And so it's important that as you're looking at your agenda items every month on your agenda, that you're able to tie those agenda items back to governance and to school improvement. And those are two really, really important things to remember. Um, I'm asked a lot of times, how does a charter system governance structure differ from a traditional school system? Well, if you look at this side of the page right here, you're going to see local board of education, superintendent, principal, school staff. Every district has those groups of people in place. Local board of education in the state of Georgia, all local boards are elected. All superintendents in the state of Georgia are hired by that local board. All schools have a principal. 
And most of the time, those principals are hired by the superintendent and approved by that local board. And then the school staff works directly with the kids. They're hired by the principal. All right. So the decisions that these people make and these groups of people make is very similar in all school systems around the state, all 180 of them. The difference in our 48 charter systems is that we have another group of people right over here, our local school governance teams. And those gov governance teams provide a foundation for the work these folks over here are doing. They provide advocacy, they provide support, they provide input, they um, provide different perspectives on, and, and they participate in the decision making when they are asked to do that. And so one of the things I can tell you as a charter system superintendent, I was a superintendent before we became a charter system and superintendent after. And I can tell you that when we when I took a recommendation to the board after we became a charter system, I knew it was a good recommendation because it had been vetted by all my school governance teams, or it had been vetted by the school governance teams in those schools, which it would, would affect. Um, we had had a lot of conversation. My school governance team members had given me um, perspectives from the people that they represented. And I could truly say to my board, I know this is a, this is a well thought out good decision. And I could say that because we had a lot more people involved in making that decision than just me. Now, anything that is worth doing is worth doing well. We all know that. And we know that standards set the bar for the work that we do. Now, um, school governance teams also have quality standards. Um, the first one is that it's really important that your school governance team, the composition of that team reflects your community. What does your community look like? And uh, in many of our communities, our schools look different. Um, for example, we may have schools in a community that has a high ESOL population. So it's important to have representatives on that school governance team who understand those kids and understand those families. So it's, um, you know, and again, a, a, in other districts, we may have um, schools that have a high number of at-risk students. And so the person who may be working very closely with those students and those families might be the um, parent involvement coordinator. So that would be an important person to have on a school governance team for that school. So it's, it's important that you don't think you have to always have your teams look exactly alike, but because as long as you have those three groups of people we talked about, parents, teachers, and community members, you can put anybody else you want to on there. It's important that school governance teams meet regularly and that you comply with the open records and open meetings laws. Um, you are required to meet at least six times a year. And when you um, make your announcement for your meeting, you post it, you post your agendas, you allow the public to come into your meetings if they want to, uh, you post your minutes. All of those things are in compliance with open records and open meetings laws. Because in Georgia, if we are a, for any organization that receives at least a third of its funding through taxpayer money, the, the public has a right to know what's going on. So that's why you have to comply with open records and open meetings laws. Um, as I mentioned earlier, sticking to governance and staying out of management is super, super important. Um, believe me, you do not want to get into a lot of that management piece because that um, that is the day to day operational pieces that go into running a school or running a school system. And your job is to stick to the governance side of things. And that your job is extremely important. Um, it's also important that you all um, take your governance responsibilities very seriously and that you um, act on 
when you ask to ask to provide information that you do that when you are asked to investigate or or do some research it's important that you do that it's also important that you really receive and and understand and ask questions about um the academic and the operational and the financial progress of your school and and you know um, where you are at any given time during the school year and then participating in regular school governance team training every year just like we're doing today um, is also a not only a requirement it's also a, a quality standard for school governance teams now let's talk about what you all have done in Katusa with your decision making um, you you did yours in uh, kind of a three-year implementation a three-year phase in and you can see that in 2016 17 which was your first year under the area of school improvement goals you reviewed the school improvement plan you learned about it you you began to y'all were a brand new team then nobody had done this work before in your district and so you reviewed the school improvement plan you began to to get a greater understanding year two you began to monitor the implementation of that plan and make recommendations and then in year three you started approving the plan you had school governance team members who serve on that school improvement team and you recommend the use of flexibility to help improve the performance of your students and achieve those goals that you all have set as a charter system. So what you see over here in 2018-19 is what you are still doing. That was your last phase in. Then in personnel decisions, the first year that you all um, were a charter system, you interviewed principal candidates and you made some recommendations to the superintendent. And then the second year, you also interviewed principal candidates and made recommendations, but you added to that um, providing input into requirements for substitute teachers. And then the third year, you added to those other two that you made recommendations for additional staff positions that were specific to the school. Then when we look at financial decisions and resource allocation, your first year, again, was a learning year. So you reviewed your, your current school budget. You began to learn about school budgets and how those were developed and where the money came from and where the money was going. And then in year two, you began to provide recommendations um, for how that money could be spent. You started looking at fundraisers to approve those. You began to recommend priorities for budgets and you aligned those spending priorities with your school improvement plan. And then you started to recommend the use of your charter, what we call QBE funds, which is your state funding. And charter systems do get additional money. It's about $100 per student. So um, for your district, you can take your total number of students and multiply it by roughly $100, and that's how much money comes into your, your district. And then in year three, in addition to everything else you were doing, you started making recommendations for staff positions that were specific to your school. And you started approving your school's budget for how those additional charter system funds were being used. Then in curriculum and instruction, that first year, you again were learning and you reviewed your curriculum and you reviewed accompanying materials and you started looking at how instruction was being delivered. And then in the second year and moving forward, you started to make recommendations for changes in the cur uh, curriculum or for how that curriculum was taught and how those strategies were implemented and what were some of those innovative means of teaching kids and you began to make recommendations for those you started looking at opportunities for acceleration for students and also for remediation for students and um, how those could best be managed and how those opportunities could best be developed and implemented. You started looking at graduation requirements and program offerings. What were you offering at your high school and middle school levels? What were you offering as your pathways um, for career? What were you offering as foreign languages? And then you started really looking at the use of that broad flexibility, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. 
Then in school operations, their first year, you approved your school calendar from two choices that were given to you, and you made a recommendation to the superintendent. Then in the second year, you added to that school calendar piece, you added uh, parent involvement activities so that you began to get involved in those. Um, also approving fundraisers and how the revenues from these fundraisers would be used. And then looking at field trips and providing input into the validity of these field trips. And then in year three, you added to all that that you were doing, um, looking at school operations such as partnerships, co-curricular activities, extracurricular activities, stakeholder surveys, and community strategies and uh, our communication strategies and how you would work with those with your within your school and also within your school community. Then we also um, in Katusa, you were doing something that not everybody does. And I think this is excellent that you are doing this. It's, it's very, very beneficial. You have what is called a Superintendent's Advisory Council for Excellence or the ACE team. Um, and what this team does is it meets with the superintendent each year, the school principal and one school governance team member who is not a staff member serve on that team to represent your school. And you all provide feedback and advice to your superintendent regarding the work of the school governance teams. All right, we talked about bylaws earlier. And um, again, I just want to give you just kind of a, a little um, capsulated um, view of what your bylaws look like and then encourage you to go and look at those. Um, I think it's if you haven't done this this year as a uh, school governance team, it's always good to spend some time during a school governance team meeting and let's just go, go over the bylaws and look at them. Make sure you understand them. What you all do in Catoosa is you have a common set of bylaws that are used by all of your school governance teams so that they're very consistent. Um, they are approved by your Board of Education and they are reviewed annually and they may be amended by your board um, if the school governance team requests that and if the amendment has been presented to the superintendent at least 30 days prior to the to the board meeting. So if there are, you know, again, you it's hard because we have changing needs, we have changing um, challenges, we have, you know, for example, COVID. COVID gave us like a whole new perspective on meetings. You know, we couldn't meet face to face. So we learned to meet like we're doing today. And um, so it's important that you review these bylaws annually. And if they need to be amended, that you follow that process your district has set up. Your um, bylaws also outline a lot of things. It, they really talk about your structure, your processes, your timelines. That's your um, sort of your playbook for operation. So your training requirements and expectations are in there. Any um, meeting attendance requirements are there. Um, it spells out your roles and responsibilities as school governance teams. It talks about how your officers are elected and what their roles and responsibilities are. It talks about um, how you engage your stakeholders, how you elect the members of your team or appoint the members to your team. There is a process to remove members and the reasons are given for those. And then also what, it, what your protocol is for open records and open meetings and how you um, ensure that you do um, meet the requirements of those laws. Okay, and then the last thing I wanna talk with you about is this broad flexibility. And as I said earlier, we have 180 school systems in our state and we have one set of laws and rules. And you can imagine we have districts that are very, very small. We have districts that are very, very large, um, like Atlanta Public Schools. We have districts that are very small, like Taliaferro County, which has only one school in it, it has a K-12 school. We have rural uh, communities. We have urban communities. We have communities that are, you know, in the northern part of our state, southern part of our state, middle of our state, coastal region. Um, 
it doesn't matter. You can be right next door to each other as a school district and you have very different um, cultures sometimes, very different resources, very different challenges. So by trying to make one set of laws fit 180 very, very, very different school systems. It was like putting a square peg in a round hole. It just didn't work. So the broad flexibility that is granted to you as a charter system is the freedom that allows you to waive most of what is in Title 20 and most of what are most of those state um, board of education rules and guidelines. Now, the important thing to remember about your flexibility is that it's intended and absolutely should be used to design and implement innovative practices that are going to help your kids, that will advance student achievement, that will support your school improvement plan, that will support your district strategic plan. You don't increase class size simply because you can increase class size. There needs to be a reason for that, such as um, in the middle of the year, for example, you may have a student come in and if you are over, if that student puts you over maximum class size, then if you didn't have this waiver, you would have to hire another teacher and split that class up. And that wouldn't be good for anybody. So, you know, you, it's really important to, again, as you're thinking about how to use broad flexibility, that you're thinking of it in terms of aligning that with that school improvement plan and those goals and your district strategic plan and goals. Now, we do have a few things that are not included in broad flexibility. All federal laws are not uh, waivable. Um, you do not have a contract with the federal government, so any federal laws still must be followed. Um, we do have made a little bit of, of, and I think actually quite a lot, of progress um, in being able to have some flexibility in federal laws, um, especially where money is concerned. We have something that's called consolidated funding, and we have school systems that are exercising that. I don't know if you're doing that in, um, in Catoosa or not, but it means that if you follow certain protocol and, and guidelines that you can use you can sort of put state money and uh, state money, local money and federal money sort of all in one pot and use it as you need to use it and not use it based on what the law says you have or how the law says you have to use it. So um, that might be something that you want to check into and see if you all have any kind of um, uh, if you if you do any into that consolidated funding. Also, any state, federal, and local laws or rules or guidelines that deal with civil rights, um, health, safety, and well-being of people in your buildings, or accountability still must be followed. And also, we've had one just recently added, and it deals with the Early Intervention Program, which is the program that um, provides instruction in the elementary grades to students who are at risk. Um, and with those are not waivable anymore. So what you uh, need to do as far as EIP is concerned um, or early intervention program is just to look at the guidance from the state because that guidance um, can change periodically. All right, so let's take a look at what would happen if you did not have the option to uh, use your flexibility. And this is just a, a, a challenge that that you very likely might and probably would meet in your school district. Georgia law and um, State Board of Education rules say that promotion and retention of students in specific grade levels must be based on a student's performance on one test score. Um, and let's say that you have a school and their data teams and their response to intervention teams, their teachers have determined that, you know, a lot of kids don't need to be retained in that grade level because they maybe had a few gaps in just a few areas. 
And maybe they don't need to repeat an entire grade. They might just need to have uh, some time to kind of fill in those gaps and some time to get some remediation and master those skills. So if you didn't have uh, flexibility, this state board rule that I'm showing you right here would not allow you to do what you want to do and just, you know, base the student's promotion retention on a totality of information and not just on that one test score. But because you are a charter system and you do have that broad flexibility, if you have that situation occur, what you can do is you can look at all the information you have on the student and then you know, making some very um, data informed decisions, working with those parents, then you could might make the decision that those students should receive instruction based on their needs and not on their grade level designation. And, and you could, you know, very likely a student may not need to be in remediation an entire year. That student may only need to be in remediation six weeks or nine weeks or one semester. So you have a lot more flexibility in how you serve the needs of your students. Okay, we want you to keep in touch with us at the Charter System Foundation and at the Georgia Department of Education. So let me tell you a little bit about our foundation. We, um, the Georgia uh, Charter System Foundation is a nonprofit. Uh, you see the website right up here, and I really encourage you to go to that website and take a look at it. Um, Dan Weber is the executive director, and Mr. Weber is a former senator in the state of Georgia, and in fact was the senator who wrote, he authored, the uh, Charter System Act of 2007. He is an attorney by, by a profession and um, has done so many wonderful, wonderful things and led the charge on so much good charter system work at the state level. He and his assistant, Pam Talmadge, are well versed in how the political world works. They um, are lobbyists and they are very, very busy during the legislative session uh, working in Atlanta at the Gold Dome to make sure that um, they are protecting the uh, the work that is done in our charter systems and trying to make sure that laws are not passed that are going to prevent you from doing that good work and making sure that laws are passed that will help you with that good work. I am a consultant for not only the Department of Education, but also for the Charter System Foundation, um, as is Dr. Emily Limbeck, who is also a retired superintendent. Um, Emily retired from Marietta City Schools, and Marietta was one of our first four charter systems way back in 2008. So what we do at the Charter System Foundation is basically we provide support to you through training, through advocacy. We have a, um, a, a conference. It's going to be virtual this year. Hopefully we get to do face to face again next year. But it's a virtual conference that's being held on November 16th. Um, if you're interested in attending that, then um, if you'll just send Pam an email or go on the foundation website, you'll see more information and a link to register. And we have a always a great turnout with that annual conference because we have systems. We dedicate that day or that morning. It's a half a day. We dedicate that morning to school districts sharing what they're doing and how they're doing it and how they are meeting these challenges that so many of us are facing in education. Uh, you see my contact information there. And then the Georgia Department of Education is the agency that um, handles your contract. And I also work as a consultant with them and we're, and, and we'll be working with you and it has, I've already started working with you on the um, renewal of your contract. So I just want to say thank you for all the really, really great work that you do. You are making a difference in the lives of your students. And, and I hope that you never, ever forget that. And I hope that you never discount the, um, the value of the work that you're doing. So thank you again for being here. And um, thank you again for the work that you do. I want to thank you for serving on your school's local school governance team.
Catoosa County Public Schools became a charter system in 2016. Adopting the charter system model with distributed leadership and shared decision making through local school governance teams has resulted in great success for our students and our schools. Today, I will present a direction for our charter system renewal application, and I will be asking for your input and suggestions. I know some of you have been serving on local school governance teams for several years, but for those who are new, I will review the innovations we included in our original charter application. Katusa U. Katusa U provides high school students authentic work experience through internships in the school system that are paid by the school district. The technology internship piloted in 2016 and it has continued successfully. Partnerships with post-secondary schools to increase dual enrollment. We have strong partnerships with Georgia Northwestern Technical College and Dalton State College. High school students may earn up to 30 hours of college credit free through these colleges while they are earning high school credit for graduation. From here to career. This was originally planned as a high school class to connect students with employers, and it has become our college and career academy initiative. Let's get connected. Let's Get Connected is our one-to-one -one technology initiative. We are purchasing new technology devices for every student this year and updating 21st century technology in every classroom. Middle School Katusa Online Academy. We launched this initiative as a few classes for middle school students. And with COVID, we now have a full curriculum for middle school students to enroll in school online. STEM Opportunities. Some local school governance teams fund STEM teachers with charter system funds. Every student in Catoosa County has the opportunity to participate in the annual technology competition. Flexible scheduling. With the online academy for grades K through 12, the district can provide flexible scheduling to meet a variety of individual needs for any student. To prepare for a new strategic plan in this charter system renewal, the Board of Education launched a survey in April of 2021 to receive stakeholder input. Over 1,300 people participated in the survey and with 75% of the responses from parents. The questions asked were, what are the greatest challenges the school district must address over the next five years to provide a quality education for all students? What are the most important skills and abilities students need to know or be able to do to be prepared for a successful future? What evidence do you use to evaluate the quality of the education of our district? What financial priorities should the district establish for the next five years? This chart summarizes and compares stakeholder responses on all four survey questions. School improvement goals are highlighted in red. 12 of the top responses align with improving student achievement. Nine of the responses are marked with asterisks. The overwhelming theme from the survey is that stakeholders expect the school system to prepare students with skills to be successful in college and career after they graduate from high school. Two personnel goals are highlighted in blue. Stakeholders support recruiting quality educators and retaining them by providing competitive salaries and benefits. Operation goals are highlighted in orange. These are consistent with our previous survey to maintain safe, secure, and well-maintained schools. East Blast makes it possible for us to accomplish these goals. Technology goals are highlighted in green. Stakeholders believe providing technology is a great challenge over the next five years, and it should be one of our highest financial priorities. Student services goals are highlighted in purple. We are fortunate to achieve the goal from our last strategic plan to have SROs in all schools. Now, stakeholders indicate that mental health professionals and services should also be a priority. The majority of stakeholders indicated that college and career readiness is a priority. So the following will be addressed in our charter and system renewal application. Preparing students to be college and workforce ready. Mastering workplace soft skills. Mastering personal management goals. 
understanding consumer financial goals, mastering communication skills, understanding how to collaborate, work productively, and resolve conflicts, graduating with college credit, career technical certificates, diplomas, and degrees, participating in career technical pathways, providing a variety of career technical pathways and opportunities. The Systems Charter System Renewal application represents a paradigm shift. A new culture will permeate throughout the system, emphasizing career exposure in elementary school, career exploration in middle school, and career experiences in high school. To accomplish a K-12 college and career focus, we will need support from business leaders, community members, elected officials, the Chamber of Commerce, the Economic Development Authority, and our parents. We have named this initiative Katusa Connects. Elementary school years are an ideal time to foster children's enthusiasm about what they want to be when they grow up. Typically, in elementary school, students want to work in the careers they have seen, teachers, nurses, doctors, and law enforcement officers. We plan to reinforce these careers and also expose students to careers in other fields they may not have seen, including technology and engineering. We believe students who are exposed to career opportunities early will see college and high demand careers as achievable goals. Elementary activities may include, get on the bus with us. We will retrofit a bus to highlight different careers and take the bus with business professionals to our elementary schools. Georgia's Career Technical Agriculture Education Division includes career guidance and classroom activities that we will utilize and support with guest speakers. The Department of Labor sponsored the Georgia Best at School program to facilitate classroom discussions about soft skills that lead to success at school, at work, and in life. Fifth grade students will participate in a From Here to Career Academy field trip led by Academy Student Ambassadors. The focus in middle school will shift to career exploration to help students determine careers that are a good fit for them. We currently use the Youth Science Aptitude and Interest Assessment in ninth grade. This is a comprehensive aptitude and interest assessment that helps students understand their aptitude, our natural abilities, and their interests. A detailed report matches their aptitude and interest to identify best fit careers. U Science has added components for middle school, snippet and snapshot that we plan to implement. We have a great opportunity to partner with the Junior Achievement Discovery Center in Dalton, Georgia. Sixth grade students will participate in BizTown, where they will interact in a simulated economy and take on the challenge of running a business. Seventh grade students will participate in Finance Park, which is an immersive simulation that enables students to develop skills to successfully navigate a complex economic environment and discover how today's decisions can impact their future. Students will attend a field trip at the From Here to Career Academy to explore career opportunities with instructors, students, and guest speakers from industry. CTAE Career Awareness and Georgia Best at School units will continue in middle school. The focus in high school will shift to career experiences to help students develop a post-graduation plan and to help them understand the steps they need to take in high school to achieve their life goals. Our goal is for every high school student to understand how they will transition from here in a Catoosa County High School to their future in a career. Ninth grade from here to career class. Every ninth grader will participate in this semester long class to understand their youth science results, develop a post-graduation plan that will include technical school and a four-year degree or higher, participate in life skills instruction and professional skills training, and develop a resume. Tenth grade students will visit the From Here to Career Academy for a career fair that includes business and industry professionals and career counseling. In partnership with the Chamber of Commerce, high school students will participate in Life Skills 101, which will focus on financial literacy and necessary life skills, including automobile maintenance. Job experiences are critical for students to understand careers. The system is exploring opportunities for virtual job shadowing 
and will partner with the Chamber of Commerce and the Economic Development Authority to expand work experiences in career fields. Throughout high school, the system will focus on college and career counseling. Some careers need technical skills while others need degrees. For college-bound students, schools will provide workshops on applying for college and financial aid. In August 2023, the system will open the From Here to Career College and Career Academy. The journey to opening an academy began with a business and community listening luncheon in 2017. With overwhelming support, the Board of Education moved forward with this initiative. College and career academies are specialized charter high schools that partner with business and industry, as well as post-secondary institutions to prepare students for high demand careers in the region. The From Here to Career Academy will open with eight pathways that include law enforcement and emergency management, nursing and therapeutic services, construction management, welding and machine tool technology, logistics and supply chain management, information technology and cybersecurity, teaching as a profession, and industrial systems technology and mechatronics. Pathways will be available as dual enrollment with Georgia Northwestern Technical College and Dalton State College, so students may earn up to 30 hours of free college credit. Pathways are vertically aligned for students to continue post-secondary education if they choose, or students may enter the workforce in good paying jobs. Students participate in professional skills training with a talent development specialist one block a week, so they are prepared with the worth ethics and soft skills that business are desperately seeking. Katusa U currently is a system paid student internship program with a technology department. It will be expanded to align with academy pathways, including teacher aides and healthcare techs. Industry partners will also provide work experiences aligned with pathways. We are very excited about the focus for our new charter system contract to prepare students in K-12 for college and career. Please discuss these plans with your governance team and provide input by December 10, 2021. Thank you.